okay, checking up where we had the last time I tried to talk about it, it was visible, but you can know, only best visible on the last one. Video, so they should be able to access the video. Uh, but we have a small video, but you probably can't read that. I can't get the camera to go off of it. Uh, as we said, first moment, and remember, anytime we're doing integration, we want to focus on a particular area. We're partitioning a region, whether it be an area two-dimensional region of volume, or uh, in the case of the surf center, we'll kind of increment of the parameter space. Okay. Or in the case of the line here, we'll same thing, the increment of the parameter. Uh, for a line interval, we only have one parameter, typically T, so we'll have a typical P sub I, minus one, T sub I, P sub I star. We look at what happens just in one typical spot. Then we form a sum, take the limit as number of subdivisions approaches infinity, or more generally as the mesh on the partition approaches zero. And we get ahead. And the process, once you have the expression for the typical length, you pretty well know there's that much more you have to do. Now, uh, for a moment, you want to find a moment of a given. And now, moments are important. They're important in physics, they're also important in probability. And we have other applications. You can have higher and higher moments. Okay, the first moment, well, you have an increment, you have a point or an axis, you have an R vector. On that point on that axis, usually increment in question. Okay. Uh, if it's an axis, you have to go perpendicular to the axis. If you're doing it about a point, you just go to the point there, and there's nothing to be perpendicular to. Does that make sense? Okay. And the physical interpretation of an axis. Uh, Simply, if you have a map, it's kind of risky. Have to be careful of balancing. If you have a mass at some distance from an axis of rotation, then the torque you need to exert depends on how far you are from the axis and on the mass. Okay, the mass is twice as close. You only need to have as much talk. Okay. Well, that's just a particular idea. Uh, if you had a physics course and if you have a better sense of what that means, that's not a particularly difficult idea. That's a first moment. So your first moment is just your distance from the point or axis of rotation to the area increment or volume increment that you're talking about. You take that distance well to the sample point. So it's the R vector that goes from the point or axis to the sample point. And you then sum that up over volume increments or over area increments. Same idea, but the details of volume increments are a little different than they are for area increments. Can be three dimensions. Typically, you have to do triple. Okay. Uh, so that's what we're saying. Okay. Second moment corresponds. If I want to flip this thing up 10 degrees in half a second, okay? I don't want to flip it too far. Okay. You know, we're, we're, that's what I mean. 
it's a good thing I moved because it fell on a pad area of the floor and didn't do any damage. Why all the more steel Okay. Uh, so flip that up. Okay. Well, now if I want to flip it up an equal angle here, it's four times as high if I'm flipping it up at the same time. And we've kind of demonstrated that. Uh, take my word for that. Uh, or you can experiment with it yourself. Use something a little more stable than what I just used there to do. Uh, but that would be a second moment. Okay. So it's just like a first moment being sperm. Uh, distance R. Okay. And R sub I is the magnitude of your R your R sub I back. Uh, so that's yes, straightforward enough. Um, okay. So in this case, in this case, we're assuming that you're just accelerating the region or supporting the region or moving region, which has a mass that's equivalent to its area or its volume. Now, typically, you don't have a mass density. So really, what I've done here, we assume the mass density is one. It's one unit of mass per unit of area or one unit of mass per unit of volume. If you have a density function, and it's especially if it's not uniform, then you have to multiply the density at your sample point by your area. It's really the density multiplied by the area before you then multiply by the R side. So the same thing both ways. Usually with an area density typically all use the same. You can use any letter we want to do that. Uh, actually you can use lambda, you can use delta, you can use sigma, sigma you can use rho. It depends on what you mean. If you're working in spherical coordinates, you probably don't want to use rho for the adjustment. Okay, well, then we either get this expression and this for doing the first moment, first power of r, or we get this expression or this expression or the r is square. Being an I in this R, I think it's not going to be an X. Okay. And then this leads to what? It leads to the integral of density times RI. I have delta H should be DH. Well, the same thing with the dv. I'm only using a single integral sign. That means we're integrating it over the region with that which be a double integral typically for an area, triple integral for volume. Okay. And then similar with this. So, In the case of a moment integral, we're going to square the R sub I. But you still have the same mass. Okay. You still have your delta times your area increment, mass density times area here or here. That doesn't get squared. That's the mass. Okay. The only thing that gets squared, the only thing that changes here is the R. And under the interval, we would have the I or the R. Okay. Okay, well. That's the idea. We can then find the centroid 
radii of dilation and all kinds of stuff. And you know, need The mass of us in words is the point where the torque of the object think what the torque you get. The entire mass is concentrated at that point. So if you got this longer and you're Axis of rotation or your point of rotation is here. You measure your rotation about this point. Do this on the next axis. Then we've got some object sitting on the x axis. And we want to measure about this point. Maybe the mass is even more extensive. Okay. Well, we can get some torque. Okay, or it could be an integral of R delta dx. This is just in one dimension. And that's all I'm going to do. Read the books explanation of interest, which you presumably have been through. Um, so it's just you know, delta times dx. Well, the delta times the length increment is your mass density times your length increment. That's going to give you that. And you multiply that by r, which would be like x minus x naught. Yeah. 
If you concentrate all the mass at the front point, just bring all this into one big old lump, maybe about here. The exposition of the center of mass is going to be the X such that this isn't bar here. Well, such that the torque of the total mass at this point is equal to the torque you have. That leads to, in this case, our figure, our distance from here to here, multiplied by your mass. Get your torque by integrating, and you get your mass by integrating. So this torque is what you get by integrating. This mass is what you get by integrating. And you apply that. So represents It's kind of good to understand that. It's one of the revelations that we get in the world It relates directly to things that we can experience tangibly, especially for first moments, for talks. We can feel those. We can balance things and all kinds of things we can do now. Generally, you know, High school physics class, which nobody in this region gets much of, not even available. It's terrible. Um, it's a little harder to relate to this. In high school physics class, you take a meter straight and you hang weights from it and you balance it, you move the weights around to another balance pose, and you get a tangible understanding of it. And then you come. Probably the university, and you get a physics course and don't have that experience, and it's harder to learn. And you can't really take time in a university physics course, calculus course, go back and do all the high school stuff. So you're kind of building on a difficult foundation. Uh, it's well worth thinking about. Okay, I think we understand part of the word of Our blocks, this represents, the surface represents an increment of the area of a graph, f of x, y. Then partial derivative with respect to y is your slope in the y direction. Partial 
group with respect to Exodus from the Engine group. That's how we intuitively understand it. We build that up by doing the limit, you know, right? know that we need Then, of course, if we end up glamorizing a lot of things. And so we've got. We got a function of x, y with x equals u, p, y equals v of t. Then f is ends up being a function of t. Okay, so basically you're parameterizing x and y. Maybe u of t is a cosine of a, and v of t is a sine of a. More frequently encountered parameterization. Uh, now that would be where you have function here. Okay. Not just taking how you would be a function of part A component of. And then you can let A go from zero to infinity, let's say you go from zero to two pi, you get the whole thing. Okay. Now, if it's just U of T and V of T, really you parameterize a path. You can a nice smooth function, you can parameterize a smooth curve. Okay. If you want to know how quickly X changes with respect to T on that curve, and you better understand how these change. Now you can always explicitly plug in whatever this expression is and whatever this expression is, right? But you don't need to do that. Uh, you can say that, okay. Okay, the way I said it is. T changes, that causes X to change. Okay. So there's some rate of change of X with respect to T. And of course, if X changes, that causes F to change. So there's some rate of change of F with respect to X. So let's just say at some point, the rate of change of X with respect to T is two. And the rate of change of F with respect to X is three. Well, change of one unit in T is going to change X by two units. And a change of two units in X is going to change that by six units because we multiply the rates of change. So T drives X to change and X drives F to change at the rates that are indicated by these rivers. Okay. And uh, I'm sure. Rate of f respect to x and y, each of those is an option. Okay. Well, it can say the same thing about y. If t causes y to change, so that per unit of t y changes by five units, and a change in y. Causes that to change by negative five times that many units. 
Well, then you've got what I say, what I say, which was three negative five, that'd be like negative 15 units per change. A change in T will cause F to change by negative 15 units, or the rate of negative 15 units per unit of T. Okay. And if this one causes, if the change in T causes, ultimately causes F to change by plus six units per unit of change in T, you get a net change of negative nine units per unit of T. Now, you can write that out with time and Okay. But there's the idea of the chain. It's not just a bunch of formulas that you memorize. It's something that makes total sense. Okay. So if you have Write this to indicate that x is a function of u and v and y is a function of u and v. Then for the partial of g with respect to u and v. You think that if u changes, that's going to change x and it's also going to change y, right? So what effect does a change of u have on x? Um, and then what is a change in x? How does a change in x drive a change in g? Well, it's very similar to what I said here. You take the partial of g with respect to f and multiply that by the partial of x. With respect to u. So you think u changes by a certain amount, that's going to cause x to change by a related amount, depending on what that partial derivative is. So you just multiply the change in u by whatever this partial derivative is, it gives you the approximate change in x, and then you multiply that by the rate at which g changes with respect to x. That's just that simple. Okay. Now, of course, U has changed, and that's caused G to change because U changes X, which changes G, but U also changes Y. So, you better say, oh, well, you better account for the fact that U also changes Y. Okay. So, okay. Uh, so we get this. There's no big mystery intuitively why this should be up. Now, you can use the little definition of partial derivatives to prove all this. It gets a little messy. If you keep in mind what everything means, it's not hard to deal with those proofs. Okay. Okay, then you have the partial of G with respect to V because you ask yourself, well, V, v changes, that's going to change G because V is going to change Y, which is going to change V, and V is going to change X, which is going to change V. How does that work? Well, this pattern is pretty easy to memorize. You want to make sure the pattern makes sense. So, if V changes, that changes X. And if X changes, that changes G. You multiply the rate at which X changes with respect to V by the rate at which G changes with respect to X, and you get the rate at which G changes with respect to V due to the effect of V on X. Then we add that.
Partial Y is expected to be as a past change in V drives a change in Y. And partial V is expected Y is a past but change in Y drives a change in V. Okay. If you think about that, the whole idea of partial derivatives and the chain rule starts to make a lot of sense rather than just being a bunch of symbols in the next way. And at this stage of the course, you want to do as much of that as you can. Oh, gee, I don't know if you're There we go. Okay. Integration, just a general overview of the integration. And you're typically going to have a region, it might be a line, it might be part of the x axis, it might be the one axis, it might be a curve. If it's a line, you just do partition the x axis from A and B. Look at what happens in a typical partition, write a song, don't you see that? Okay. If it's a curve, you get a single angle. You got a parameterized and curve, and you get some parameters. It's like you have a x and t and a y of t function. Yeah. R cosine t, h sine t, and t function. And, and some of the t that means two pi, so you get the whole x. And you know, that varies. There's all kinds of things to have. But your parameters based q, go p, typically zero to two pi. Simple to the X or something it doesn't have to be multiplied. Uh, you might go from zero to one if you're just doing some linear functions. Okay. Or you know, other other things. And we've recently seen plenty of examples of that. So I'm not going to waste precious time in which we have like the world that problems. And that's the end. Okay. That doesn't mean I won't be around. I'll be around for office officials. These Monday, Tuesday points, and I'll post them. Um, and I'll also ask them to certain, certain hours of the I'm, I'm looking at like something like 12 to 3, but I want to make it symmetric about the end of the exam. So, you know, I want to have before the end of one exam, I want to have before the start of the next exam. This will be you know, typically. Those hours tend to be Okay. So, uh, do if you have certain preference office hours, I don't understand how much it's going to be. Well, I'll have the Monday and Tuesday works. So, I think I'll be working with the extent that I can tell from the light. Okay, and a prime part of this thing. Uh, okay, so anyhow, integration. Start from the digression. You want to get the national level. Okay, so you partition the region or your parameters. Okay. Now, if you've got a two dimensional region, okay, well, that might be a region in the plane. So, I'll choose the partition for X or your Y. And then partition the other variable in terms of the x and the y. And I might go to a little of that in the mind. Okay. If it happens to be a two dimensional surface in three dimensions, or four, five, or eight, or seven, or five dimensions, um, you're going to need to parameterize. Okay. You got a surface in. But if you've got a surface, you're going to be able to parameterize it with two parameters. And we've seen many examples of that in the last recent weeks. So, 
kind of have uh, the ability to do that. So either way, you're going to get a element to parameterizing to parameters. If it's just X and Y, you don't really have to go into parameter space. You've already got your parameter. Okay. If you're in parameter space, then you got to represent your angle accordingly. Okay. Uh, now, triple angle, three dimensions. Same stuff. Okay. Everybody did well in the homework <laughs> on the integration, although one of those uh, is going to be written homework. You can have a web assignment. And hopefully, you did that. I so anyhow, we got all of that. Um, and that's really the only thing on the details. Jerry is the coordinates for my public standard for coordinates and that's hard to go into the data. So you gotta, you gotta be okay with that. And if you have to you want to come to me combine. Okay. So there we go. Um that one picture one day. So you're integrating over the region that looks like this in rectangular coordinates. Well, this gets a little bit complicated in different kinds of regions. Um, uh, here, here, if you partition. Axis. Not your typical partition will run from in your typical partition. Are you going to use what else? We call it kind of isolated typical region to look at the sample. Do you see the sample point, the endpoints of the region? And you go back. I think you know what you're seeing. Your x values, well, here's the x value that you're going to get the standard value for the definition. Y values will go from here to here. Then it's in that function. You have this region that approximates the regions, or approximates the part of the overall region corresponding to this interval. And now uh, it isn't perfect because it's a rectangle. But some people shrink everything down. Uh, that Or you have by like, flattening off the ends pretty much this And then you partition Y. So for every X partition, you partition Y. And you're going to have them principal. This is going to be a delta x y. The old y chain. You got your sample point. That's y star, y j star. So we can kind of look at this. Okay. 
And if we're integrating some quantity within this interval, whether it be an F dot DS or a delta or a row or an F, okay, whatever it is, whatever that something is, I'm just going to call it F. You can get. It might be That would be necessarily be an important application. Uh, but when we go to three dimensions, if we go to surfaces, it could be. Right here, you know, what I'm saying is you integrate a variety of things over these words. And then the sum. Probably, but the sum it doesn't really matter where the delta x and delta y goes in the integral of both of So I'm going to do the uh, delta y. And it goes F I here because I'm summing the Y to the point. But I thought that's a process. You want to know that process to be able to apply it. Now, where do we apply it? Well, we see the Y variety gives us the five. Where we get to in the chapter on vector calculus is we'll find this quantity. So we look at the inverse. Okay. And that's where we get the big interval here. Um, you know, we start with Green's theorem. Um, you know, also, divergence of curl and stuff like that. Now, I'm not going to define divergence of curl, but I think that's pretty straightforward. 
recently we talked about the fact uh, that if you have a conservative field, we talk about a conservative field somewhat last time, uh, it's a curly signal. Okay. Uh, well, you know, the fact that the curl of a gradient is zero because it, the conservative field is one that can be derived from a gradient from a potential function that is the gradient of the potential function. Okay, so we've got all that stuff. So make sure you straight on those ideas. We have a little perspective here. Remember what our in the finish says. Green's theorem is the integral of the 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 of Generalize it. Pretty much any old region with a two dimensional or three dimensional. It's okay. Uh, so we'll do curl F, not M, the normal component of curl F over the region. Uh, that relates back to Green's theorem. Green's theorem is kind of a special case of this, where your region is just part of the xy plane. Okay? It's the region coverage in three dimensional space. It's apparently messy. Then we have the divergence theorem. Says that the interval of divergence over the interior is equal to the flux. It's three things those are so much. All that we're the volume region is equal to the box. But there's some pretty thing up in the F be orientable and other restrictions. But in the applications we're likely to run into, it's the intuitive idea that the carry is for a lot of it. You want to be as conversant as you can be with the conditions under which the thing applies, but you have not, at least in the final sign assignments, seen a lot of stuff for those restrictions in the So if it appears in the exam, it won't be for a whole lot of points. Um, it just says that your circulation is equal to the interval of the curl. Well, the curl in every little increment measures the circulation of every increment. You add it all up, and this increment cancels most of this increment, and the interior increment, everything gets canceled out. We've drawn those pictures at least a couple of times. 
Okay, we want to have that. Thank you. Um, so that's all this is really saying. And intuitively, it's not that difficult to grasp. Now, the details of doing these integrals and setting them up. Memorize things, you got to break things up. A lot of times, the integrals are not pretty obvious. Um, and I'm not going to give you reasons like this. It's a dumbass stop at this point. I, I've only done this from here to here. When we get into here to here, we're going to have to set up something. So I don't and because we've got a limit from here to here, and then we go from here to here, and there's nothing in between. But then from here to here, it's going to be like this. Okay. Now, we've got region type A and type B region and stuff like that. So we did that. Um, it comes down to common sense, but practice. Okay. So I could write out some words to describe this. Um, this is information around the boundary. It's going to have a world park boundary that goes back to the street. Okay, no end of the So. Uh, in here, here curl f dot m is some of circulations within region three. It's so, sort of like conservation of circulation. Okay, again, we don't have time to go through all the details of this, but uh, we've got some time left. So let me ask uh, if you have any questions or any topics you want me to say a little bit more about. Corrections. Uh, we would do an area integral of F dot S, etc. Uh, that would be the line integral of the line integral of the area integral. Uh, it would be like an F dot M. Well, normal computer, the vector force with respect to area. I didn't make any sense. Um, okay, very good.